If you're thinking of making a career change, you're in the right place. I'm Yesham Nicholson, and Your Big Career Move is your opportunity to listen to stories from ordinary people who've made extraordinary career changes. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you feel inspired to make your own career change, but you're not quite sure where to start, why not buy my book, Ready to Quit Your Job, or join my next career coaching program, both of which you can find at yescareercoaching.com. So today I'm speaking with Mike Lane Evans. He has gone from the world of acting into the world of communication coaching. Um, And I can't wait to dissect this. Thanks so much for agreeing to be here today, Mike. It's um, a real pleasure to have you. Can we go straight into why acting? What was it about acting that appealed to you? Uh, Thank you for having me to to start with. Um, So I started acting when I was eight. Um, and very briefly, my uncle got a video camera. And for those Gen Z people listening to this, um, this would have been 1992. Cameras were no longer the shoulder ones, but they were still pretty chunky. And he got a video camera and my cousin, his eldest son, basically stole it on the very first day. And we started making movies. So this was in the countryside. My uncle owned a farm and we would make films around the farm um and we would do this every half term easter summer christmas and my cousin in question then has, is still now um a partner in a, a film production company and doing really well for himself and i became an actor so it really informed the foundation of like who we were and what we were about in through play in a way we were just kind of playing around but it really kind of formed these things for us so a lot of people play, and I mean, I definitely have memories of having this old video camera and playing around with it and having my friends and doing like crazy music videos and stuff. But it never occurred to me, for example, that I was going to be an actor. So what was it that went from, hey, this is fun playing around with it to actually this is what I want to do for a living? I, there was not one distinct moment. What there was was throughout that first year so that I'm one of six cousins three siblings and three on the other side and what became really apparent in that first year is that me and the cousin who's now a filmmaker he um we would talk all year about it we would plan so that we could hit the ground running on day one with our next project if you will and it was that was fun for us it was like purposeful it really like got us excited and we would then become inspired by, you know, watching TV or watching movies or even going to the theatre. We would be inspired in moments outside of those school holidays that we would we would want to take there. And I think, like a lot of people in any job, they want to they want to have purpose, right? They want to have something that makes them excited. They're not just going to work and then forgetting about work. But actually, thinking about it all the time isn't necessarily meaning you're you know not able to detach from work instead it's just that you're in a in a world that is just so fun so interesting so inspiring for you that it's just sort of always on your mind and in some capacity and um, and that was my first real experience of that um, I'm sure I had experienced it before with toys or something but that for that to then kind of really relate to how my adult life spanned out um panned out I should say um then yeah, that's uh, that. That was a real thing that happened for us throughout that whole first year. And then, where I grew up, there wasn't a youth theatre. There wasn't a. a we didn't have a theatre for a little while, for a couple of years, until the lottery rebuilt it. Um, and so, when I was eleven, they announced that there would be this youth theatre coming, and my mum put me on the wait list straight away. And it didn't open until I was twelve. And then that was it from there, because what I discovered when I was 12, meeting adults who were teaching us, was that I could make a living from this. No one had ever told me that before. Um, so then there was no looking back from sort of week one or week two of youth theatre. I was like, oh, OK, this is what I'm going to do now. Yeah, um, ironically, isn't what I've done forever, but I've got a lot of opinions on that as well. Yeah, I bet. So when you say your mum signed you up straight away, is that because you asked her to or because no, she yeah. wanted you to do that? OK. Yeah. Yeah. She just she brought she heard about it. She came home. She told me and we both agreed <laughs> straight away. It was one of those 
parent-child conversations where there was no kind of convincing on either side yeah. um, and you know I had was definitely an extrovert and I had a lot of energy as a as a child and so it was it was an obvious thing for my mum my mum felt like it was a great outlet for me um, and it was something that I'd already spent four years doing in front of cameras so I was really ready to do that in a more kind of organized way I'm just laughing inside because I'm thinking, you know, every parent listening to this that has a child that has a lot of energy, we're like, yes, this is a great way for my child to burn off some of that energy and give me a break, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that and rugby were the two things I did. I grew up in a big rugby town and I honestly, I have been trying to get my nieces and nephews into rugby already because there is just, you know, we can talk about the, the dangers as a, as a parent. Um, it's just such a, an outlet. Yeah. Acting really was that um, for well into my adulthood as well. It really helped dissipate a lot of energy. So how long did you end up doing acting as a full-time thing? Gosh, so I went to, I mean, people will argue where, if you got paid for something, effectively you're a professional. Certainly nowadays it used to be different. Um, so I think my first paid job, I was 13, 14, but... I went to theatre school or drama school um, when I was 18, left there just before my 21st birthday and then did that until I was 32, I think. Um, so COVID was the beginning. Well, it wasn't the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the real end uh, for me. I'd already had a couple of years of things permeating in my mind, but I had this conversation with someone yesterday, in fact, that, lockdown i think for a lot of people helped create like a breaker in people's lives to sort of step off the treadmill if you will in this unusual moment in history that who knows if we'll ever get anything like it again and so um as i'm sure you talk about a lot on this podcast 40 percent of people in the uk want to change their jobs right now and they don't know how to yeah well a lot of a lot of my conversations that I have with people start with during lockdown <laughs> it was like you say it was that sort of natural um well it just forced everybody to stop and think and just take a break from going through the motions and you know the eat sleep work repeat thing it was like oh hang on a tick what's going on let's just reassess where we are so interesting so you said you already had a, a few thoughts permeating can we talk about what those thoughts were yeah um i, I mean I, I, we need a longer podcast to go through the full list um <laughs> i i'm i'm somebody that kind of collects and notices things um like so before we started recording uh we were talking about children and when like in those decisions to have or to not have children I it's not for me or, or to get a dog or not have a dog that's another thing in discussion in the household it's those it, those um those moments where you see things that are good and bad for other people and so for me as an actor what I had observed in myself a lot and in others a lot was a discontentment um the way I used to describe acting and, and I actually think this can be true of many other industries I've come across since I've been coaching um is what I call the greyhound racetrack mm -hmm. so it, as the greyhound is chasing that as we all know fake rabbit that they will never catch and a lot of actors if they do get to catch the rabbit they're like oh. and I and I think that a lot of there's um there's an acting podcast out there that um, interviews quite successful actors and someone that I've worked with on this podcast said the thing about an actor is as soon as you get the, you start the job you're already thinking about the next one and it made me so angry this is years ago when I was still acting it made me so angry that he said that because I thought gosh you're making us all sound so at ease and so discontented and I realized in the years that followed that that was it, he's annoyingly quite true now that's not the case for all actors at all in the same way it's not the case for all people in any in any world it is the case for a lot of actors though um and then to kind of add a few other things to that the money is usually bad you're usually treated quite badly um the like i know a lot of people might be thinking of hollywood as soon as they think of an actor 
but I think the A-list make up something like one percent of actors globally. Um, it must be even less than that, probably. I don't know. I think since influencers and and kind of the growth of of you know social media platforms, I, I think it probably is less than that. Um, so yeah, so I, a lot of people find themselves in situations where uh, it's it's one of the biggest industries where you are offered to do it for the opportunity. So there might be some small amount of pay, or in some cases, no pay offered, um, and it's for the opportunity for the CV or the resume. Mm -hmm. And um, you realize when you start to work in other fields, how disrespectful that is. Um, and it's an interesting thing to go briefly back to COVID. What I discovered in the first two weeks of COVID that I never questioned with myself before, the first two weeks of lockdown, is how much I needed purpose. Now, if you go and study the science of it, arguably all humans need purpose, but really understanding what that purpose was for me was um, so, so important to the changes that I made. And Did that involve a lot of soul searching? Um, yes and no, in the sense that with the, all these questions I'd had about acting, I guess the soul searching had begun mm -hmm. and had been sort of dripping through for a long time but I was I was on that treadmill and I was always chasing that 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 rabbit on the greyhound track and I you do get purpose out of um entertaining people or what was more important for me this was one of the this was probably the biggest shift for me was I did a show in 20 gosh it doesn't really matter 16 or 17 and it was a true story um about child abuse and it was all true and uh i went through they, they offered us therapy and counselors throughout the process if we wanted it and one of the things that i sort of mused on one day is this is not entertainment which is like so much theater is entertainment and what i realized was that what i was doing was far more important to me than just entertainment because what it occurred to me that i'd always wanted to get out of acting was the purpose that I had started conversations I'd provided a forum that could get people talking when they left get people debating so all the favorite jobs I've ever done or bar one um fit that that format and so it made me start to analyze every single acting job I did after that so from 2016 2017 and so when COVID came I was already coaching a little and I was getting so much more purpose out of working with coaches than I was in any of the acting work that I was doing. That's uh, quite a big shift, isn't it? From being an eight-year-old that is like, <laughs> actually, all I'm interested in is acting and, and the world of acting to then having this massive shift. Like you say, it's happened over a fair bit of time. Was there... You know, because people often talk about, oh, I had to reinvent myself. And I don't love that term because I feel like, well, you're still you. You're just bringing out different parts of you. How did that feel for you, though? Did you feel like you were reinventing yourself? Did you have to create a whole new persona for yourself? How was that transition period for you? Not, it, I didn't feel that way at all. And, and I'm in danger. What I'm going to say next is in danger, this sort of cheese alert, because this might sound a bit cheesy. If anything, I felt like I was more going back to myself um, than finding somebody else because the acting industry can take you into lots of disingenuous places. And I have never felt comfortable. I've never sat easy with that. I've always been somebody that is driven most by connecting with other people. I, alongside studying acting, I studied psychology, sociology, philosophy, theology, I always wanted to understand people and what drove drove them and how how they work and where I couldn't find that in study I would find it in conversation and um, if anything I sought it more in conversation and so by stripping away those kind of things that I was chasing it, it sort of allowed me to kind of go back to more that I felt I was sort of born with uh, you know obviously we, there's the conversation of you know evolution you know how much we kind of change nurture versus nature but I, I I think there's a lot of things about me that it's almost kind of like going going back to it 
and, and I think for those people who do describe it describe it as um, reinventing themselves, I, I agree with you that it, that it's not how I would describe it, and I also understand it in the same respect because I think a lot, certainly as adults, I think we get we, we're built into habits a lot. And, and in coaching and also in certain forms of therapy, there's a lot of focus on changing those habits. We don't have to say, oh, well, that's just the way I am. It's the way I've always been, because maybe it's not the way you've always been. It's just as far back as you can remember. And it's the habit that you're kind of stuck in. And so, yeah, that's why I described that chasing the great, the chasing the rabbit, because it's that's the habit. That's what we know. And I think for a lot of people who want to change jobs that I encounter, they've had that breaker of lockdown they see okay i don't want to keep on the treadmill I, I want something different they're just terrified about what that might be or where to look for that um and why was it not terrifying for you well i'm it, just from what you've said it sounds like it wasn't terrifying but maybe i'm jumping to to conclusions no i do you know what i was thinking about this before our call um and I think if I'm really honest, it's because I had some level of security. So I started as a freelance coach. I now director of my own business. Arguably, there's no security in that. I would also argue there's no security in a PAYE job somewhere. You know, it's particularly with the volatility of the things that have happened over the last four years in, in the UK and globally. Um, and so I, I do think that sort of, um, work security and financial security are sometimes, I'm sure some economists would argue with me, if not most of the time, I think it's a, a fallacy. I think it's sort of, um, it, it's a sort of a, a false promise. And so what happened for me was that moving, there was a bridge period. So before in 2019, I'd started doing some public speaking coaching. So I didn't need to be a qualified coach for that. I was taking my skills as an actor and helping people to do TED Talks and be on stage and, yeah. and whatnot. And when in the lockdown, I was one of the lucky actors that had some paid acting work over Zoom, which was a strange time. Amazing. <laughs> and I also had clients. If anything, I had more coaching work now because the world became smaller. So we became global quite quickly. And... So coming out of COVID and really analysing those those changes for myself, I had clients and I had access to more clients and I had been getting feedback about how good I was at it. And that, you know, that feeds into all of our new purpose, I think. Like, it, I think some actors need the applause. They need that sort of public recognition. I think other people do need to sort of finish the day at night or go to bed at night knowing they've done a good job in some respect in some way whether they consciously are aware of it or not and um i had that so it was less of a leap into the dark because i i I'd sort of had that bridge period and i do i would really recommend that to any of your listeners who are looking to make changes like i'm i really don't believe oh i just like I didn't realize how much this annoyed me until I said started to say that. I really don't like the idea of like burning bridges. There's a lot of um, experts out there who will say make the leap. A lot of like business consultants and coaches that will say you need to burn those bridges. You need to make that leap, and then you you know you will learn to swim. And I just don't like it. I don't buy into it. I don't believe it because the biggest help for me was my second coach. So as a coach, for those who don't know, I I still have a coach myself. Um, and so my second coach, um, she talked to me about this, um, this no man's land. And lots of people describe it in different ways. It might be a river for some people. It might be a body of water or land or whatever. And it's a big thing in coaching. You're trying to get from here to there. And in between, there's this kind of no man's land. And what do you do through those steps? And what she suggested for me was what other jobs could I take on that would provided some security that were allow me to leave behind the things that were sort of keeping me in the acting world. So because acting often is not very well paid, you end up working really long hours to still pay the rent and 
there's no time left or energy left to be trying the new things. And I can say that now having coached across multiple industries, I recognize that in a lot of you, anybody listening to this, that there's that exhaustion and that lack of time. So for me, it was find those new things that paid a little bit better doing similar things, but allowed me just a few hours back to start exploring what was next. And I honestly can't tell you how quickly it happened. From, from then, from to starting that process to starting my own business, it was less than two years. To actually fully leaving acting, it was like six months, I think. Actually, it's one of the concepts that I talk about in the book. I call people that make the transition in the way that you did toe dippers. So, you know, we talk about the leapers, the people that take that leap of faith. And yeah. and honestly, I'm much more of a, well, dip your toe first, try other other things out, go part time in your job, you know explore options the way exactly the way that you've done I, you know I've, I'm a big fan of that but I, I have also witnessed people being leapers and that really working for them uh, because yeah. they've got a bit of a financial buffer because I don't know of redundancy money or they've inherited money or they've managed to save um, money over over a certain period of time so there are some people that for them it works really really well but I really love the approach of, well, let's just see what else I can do, how else I can earn money and just dip my toe in different areas. So thank you for highlighting one of the, the concepts of the book. And it's something that, you know, obviously in my line of work, I talk about a lot. And I, I love that your coach, the coach that you worked with also recommended that because it doesn't have to be this scary leap into the unknown. It can be something much more where you feel in control of where things are going. And most of us like to feel like we're in control. Oh, absolutely. And, and I also think for me, the description I had was financial. That's how I just described it to you. I also think that that's really beneficial for people that do have that pot of money for some, for some reason, um, for the psychological side. So yeah. it's knowing that you, this is testing it out. Is this something that you'll actually enjoy? Is it something that you're good at? Uh, is it something that you can continue to improve at? Or are you already at your peak? Because there's purpose in that. There's purpose in growing and improving. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's also where dipping the toe is really important. I think if you can start to dip that toe, even when the security is still there, I think it really helps with your confidence. Yeah. Um, but I do. I, have, I agree with you. I've seen some leapers really succeed. Yeah. Well, and it's fun, but yeah, I mean, it's fun that everybody's different, isn't it? It'd be really boring if yeah. everybody was the same and had the same attitude to everything. <laughs> yeah. so tell me about when we chatted the other day, you were saying, oh, I'm in the US and then I'm here and then I'm there. It sounds like you've got quite an exciting, um, <laughs> well, it's not a job. You've created yourself a business, but it yeah. sounds really exciting. So tell us what your day to day involves now. So, you know, I work globally. Um, I realized talking to someone the other day across six continents, um, and that can be a little difficult with the time zones. Um, so I was faced, so I started forefront coaching in January 23. And by May, I was in a situation where time zones wise and, um, requests wise, I, I had two choices, I had a choice to make, whether to start refusing work or to grow my team. And so after quite a lot of consideration, I, I, I grew the team. And so we're able to work across those different time zones a little bit without that pressure solely being on me. Um, but what happened, so my when I started, my day-to-day -day was get up at eight, start at 8.15 and probably work until about 11 p.m. Wow. And I um, used to be really big into my fitness. And on those days, not only was I not going to the gym or even, like, I wasn't leaving the house. I was barely leaving my desk other than to grab some food. Um, and it definitely helped to form and accelerate the business. I just would never recommend that to anybody and it's something i would not do again um so now my day-to-day -day, uh, is usually 
I will try and make space for fitness in the morning. I will usually start at 10.30. And then my hours can go on as late as 8, 9 p.m. Uh, if I'm working with the US. Um, so that's still, as my mom and other people who you know care about me will say, that's still a long day. <laughs> That's, that's that's not a, a regular day. Um, what I realized a lot, though, is that as a coach, you, you can't be very good if you're working too long and out, out hours. You, you to, to really be there for other people's needs, you can only do a certain amount in a day. And I say a certain amount because I genuinely believe each coach is different. It, everyone's got a different level of energy and concentration and Uh, presence and um and so yeah i found a way that really works for me and so now my day is a mixture of meetings with partners to partner with the company or with new people that are coming on board or meetings about new work it's not constant coaching back to back um, yeah. my time zones wise will mix between sort of the furthest at the moment is the middle east and the furthest west is mountain time um i at the moment i don't work australia or california basically um that's that, a whole new dimension it's a whole new dimension so yeah so i, I most of the work is virtual because of that global nature to come back to kind of your question around what the day looks like um and i'm able to do that from from my office um as we grow our uk client base and traveling more within the uk um And when I first started the business, every second week I would be on a plane to somewhere. Um, having just got married last year, that's not conducive to any kind of success <laughs> in personal life, uh, that kind of flying. Um, and so so now I try and bulk it into periods where I, so I was in the US when we first started talking for three weeks. Um, and it meant that I could travel around and see clients Um, and I try and do it on the train as much as possible because sustainability is really important to me. So that was another reason to try and bulk things. Um, but yeah, we spend 80% of our clients are global, like outside of the UK. And all four coaches currently are based in the UK. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's changing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Well, it's never, you're not going to be bored anytime soon, are you? No, no and I'm not because I, you know, I work with people across every industry i want to say every uh certainly across lots of industries and so yeah it's not it's not boring it's very exciting i mean it sounds like you're having a great time i'm really chuffed for you that it's working out so well what what's your definition of success now uh being able to go well i was going to say go to bed actually no i'll scale that back being able to finish and go and talk to my wife about my day in a way that there are things I want to share. And I, I meet people that say, there's nothing really to tell you. You know, there's, you know, it was a hard, it was hard and I got through it. And that's fun. like, we've all got, even now we have, you know, I do love my job. Everyone has those days. It's human nature. Um, yeah. My, my idea really is being able to kind of finish and feel buoyant, feel uplifted and have things that I want to, to share. Yeah, I like that definition. Um, I interviewed somebody a while ago and he said knowing his definition of success was knowing that he was going to do the same thing again tomorrow. You know, just feeling excited about the fact I've had this awesome day and oh my mm. God, I get to do it all again tomorrow. How awesome is that? Yeah, like, yeah that's it is. And, and then and I also at, at the same time, part of me thinks, well, my day isn't the same tomorrow. So I get to I get to show up in the same way but as you know as a coach you have no idea what's going to happen until you enter that space and and I find that I realized that as an actor one of the things I loved the most was improvisation it was not having the script and it was being on the spot and that that you know in human interactions you know like like coming to this session today that to this this podcast like yes sent me some Uh, questions that might that might pop up what i think is really amazing about really good podcasts like yours is that it's it's reactive it doesn't necessarily have to follow those questions 
because that's just life, right? And so if you can be like that in your job and be prepared and also then be able to work in those times where you you don't know what's coming, for me, that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, me too. I think it's fun to to not know sometimes and just, like you say, go with the flow and see where it ends up. Yeah. I think that's, that is why I love this podcast because I think if it was too formulaic, and these are the questions I must ask no matter what. I think I'd stop enjoying it. I much prefer just see see where it goes because you never know what you're going to uncover. That's really yeah. cool. And on that note, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I really hope that people listening to this will take at least one thing away. And hopefully the, the thought of making a career change is less daunting as a result of hearing your story. So thank you so much for sharing is there anything that you're like, I wish she'd asked me about that? Oh, um, I guess just for those people who are stuck wondering whether they should do it or not, I I definitely think the answer is like explore what that means. Because I, I want to say, yes, do it. That's the simple thing to say. And actually, I think the, the bigger answer is explore why you're asking yourself that in the first place. Because sometimes it might be because the grass is greener and actually when you look at what you've got and what you, you, you have, you, this is really the right place for you and the right job. And maybe it involves some kind of change or evolution within this space. And maybe it's that complete leap to somewhere new. But I think too often... We don't make time and space to ask ourselves questions and to, to answer them. So if you're, if you're asking yourself the question, should I make that leap? Yes or no, lean into that. Spend some time on your own, whether that's like walking or sitting in a room, whatever is the thing for you, swimming, being in the gym, whatever it might be, and just explore that question. Like, what, why are you asking that question in the first place? So, yeah, I think that's that's what it would be for me. Explore the possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the very, very best. Thank you.